Well, welcome to our second Thursday presentation for September 2020. Again, we can't use the theater because we're under pandemic restrictions, but I'm out here in front of the historic Reno Arch for a good reason. You know, that arch was here for a couple of reasons. It's the iconic one that first spanned Virginia Street at Commercial Row. Its history is built around two topics, automobiles and gaming. This exact arch, with some different wording you can see in this early photo, was constructed to celebrate the automobile, or more properly, to celebrate the completion of the Transcontinental Highway, also known as the Lincoln Highway in the late summer of 1929. But when gambling was legalized here two years later in 1931, this same arch was modified, adding the famous slogan that gamblers everywhere quickly recognize, the biggest little city in the world. But we're not here today to talk about the arch or even this brand new one on Virginia Street, but rather William Fisk Bill Hera. This would have been his 109th birthday, uh, and he also celebrated both gambling and cars during his remarkable life. But for the first time in history, at least in the last nine decades, there's no longer a casino that's active with his names on. It's truly the end of an era as this property closes. His first bingo operation was actually behind me over on Center Street, uh, specifically 124 North Center Street. You'd think with Bill Hara running it would be immediate success, but it wasn't. He opened in October, and by November, just a few weeks later, he was broken out of cash. He quickly realized that Virginia Street was probably a better place for a bingo hall. The largest casinos were then on Center Street, but gaming there was dominated by shady characters like Jim McKay and Bill Graham. They ran the bank club and even shadier places like the Stockade. They were a pretty rough crowd with employees like Babyface, Babyface Nelson, who still holds the record for killing the most FBI agents. On Reno's Main Street, Mr. Hare first leased the Tangle Club, renaming it Hare's Tangle Heart Bingo. This time he was successful and began to generate some profits. The Tango was about in the middle of what is now Harrah's, but was Harold's Club up until the 1990s. And he was very successful here, making a good profit. But it was World War II that helped land Harrah's, the location that became his first casino and the foundation of all his later expansion in town. Japanese American owners, headed by Freddie Omoyama, had to close their Reno Club to keep a low profile after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Hera was able to secure a lease with the provision that it would remain in place until the Japanese signed a peace treaty with the U.S. It was a pretty good deal as that first bingo hall and then the casino that followed lasted for 78 years until just recently. Eventually, Bill bought the neighboring Frontier Club and expanded to the Virginia Street front that most folks know today. Bingo only transitioned to a casino in 1946, and Hera began making real money. It was just a year later that he helped out the mother of her friend by buying two antique cars of her son who died in an accident. One was a Model T Ford, but the other was a classic Maxwell runabout. Hera thought it was a 1907 model, but he wasn't sure. He immediately began restoring the car with a mechanic from the local Reno Packard dealership. They made the car look beautifully but historically it was a disaster. There were dozens of mismatched parts, they painted it the wrong color, and it wasn't even an 07, it was a 1911. Well, the embarrassment that Mr. Harris suffered and the comments he got during that horseless carriage tour would have made many people just want to give up the hobby completely, but not so with Mr. Harris. It actually encouraged him to build this. Of course, I visited the, the car collection and was astonished at all the amount of cars he had collected. I mean, it was acres and buildings of, of cars. He just always had, had loved cars. Uh, I noticed the Maxwell when I walked in. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I had that what car he was, even though it was his first car, I don't think he was truly in love with it because it's not a totally authentic. But that was, that was what became, his driving force was the authentic restorations. Everything had to be perfect. He was a perfectionist to the nth degree and um, 
the cars especially, and, and uh, the, the museum, you know, here we were out in this old ice house, they had the floors all refinished, everything just shown, the floors shown, the cars shown, they, they, there was at least one employee that just went around polishing brass and, and copper all the time, uh, keeping the cars clean. Um, and the, even the restoration shop itself was always just immaculate. The mechanics, they were down-to-earth people. They were just real nice, nice gentlemen. They were all first-class gentlemen. You could see, actually see all the craftsmen at work in their locations. They had the different buildings for all the locations. And they had a research library, and that's what Nadine and Sydney did, was research the old cars because Mr. Hera wanted everything authentic. All the cars had to be authentic. And if they didn't have the part they needed, they had people who'd make it. And it was magnificent. I'd go out there and just walk around the shop. I'm a bit of a mechanic myself, and uh, I enjoyed just going and watching them, the craftsmen, do their work. It was unbelievable what they did. He would come out to the automobile collection at least three or four times a week, maybe more. He always did the test drive of the vehicles after they were restored. He was out there talking to all the mechanics. There was this gentleman, his name was, that worked out at the collection, he was a machinist. His name was Aldo Ripperbelly. He's, a, he's just a, a wonderful, old-fashioned Italian man. And he drove the truck uh, when they'd haul the cars around for the car tours. Sometimes Rip would drive the truck. Well, Mr. Harrow would pop in the truck and ride with Rip. Uh, because of the air conditioning. If it was real hot, they'd be down south, it was hot and humid, and he'd jump in there, and, and he and Rip were, were friends. They, you know, it, it was, it, it was, he always made it a point to go over and talk to Rip and, and, and say hi to him uh, out at work at the shop. But Bill was never content to just be around his cars. He had to be in them. And he shared his love with others whenever the opportunity arose. He would talk to the guys, the mechanics, and he would take out whatever car he wanted. It was his. One day, I was walking down Plumas. I heard this car pull up next to me, and from the sound of the car, I knew exactly what kind of car it was, because everybody knows what a Ferrari sounds like when, you, when you've heard it. And I turn around, and there's this beautiful red Ferrari sitting next to me, and I knew exactly who it was because of the uh, H on the license plate. Uh, Mr. Harris was in the driver's seat, and Mr. Harris said, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going downtown. And he says, hop in, I'll give you a ride. So I got in, I was really nervous, I was scared to death. As we were driving along, we came to the intersection of uh, Plumas and Plum Lane. And Mr. Harris says, I want to show you the beautiful, beautiful view in the city of Reno. He says, you can see the top of the hotel from here. And I looked and I says, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it never really hit me at the, the time, you know, before driving that road, I would drive it every single day. And it never really hit me about uh, seeing the, the top of Harris Hotel from there. And the, the amazing thing was, he didn't say, uh, look at my hotel. He says, you can see the top of the hotel from here, where I, uh, he dropped me off. And I said, thank you for the ride, Mr. Heron. And he said, you're welcome. He says, and he says, I'll see you at work. <laughs> when I went for this interview in Reno, I, hadn't, I was driving an old Cadillac. And when I got to Reno, my Cadillac was having a problem. So I put it into the garage there. and. Uh, was hopefully going to get it fixed. And uh, after the interview, uh, I called the garage and it really wasn't ready until the following day. And so I asked, uh, I said, you know, you have a limo or something going to the lake because I, I have to work to, tonight, you know. And he said, well, I'm going up to the lake. He said, why don't you, uh, why don't you take a uh, ride with me? I thought that was unusually nice, you know. And, but I guess I hadn't been forewarned about Mr. Harris, uh, his cars and his driving. So anyway, uh, it comes three o'clock in the afternoon and uh, uh, he picks me up and said, okay, we'll head on down the valley and that's the Washoe Valley. He said, and, uh, 
This car is pretty new, so I might have to open it up a little bit. And, and uh, not knowing what to expect, uh, we, we came through Washoe Valley at about 140 miles an hour and um, uh, came up over the hill there and he dropped me off at the, uh, the entrance here of the motel at that time. There wasn't a hotel here at that time, there was a motel on the north side. And he said, did you enjoy your trip? And I said, you know, I was, I was sort of white, I, I, I was shaken up about it, you know. Then he came to the show and I was working that night and he just waved and it, it was quite an experience. He told me a story once that Sammy Davis, he gave Sammy Davis a tour of the collection and there was a white car, a white manufacturer. And uh, Sammy said to Bill, why don't you have a black car? And Bill didn't say anything, to, I don't know what the answer was to Sammy, but he said, there was a car, uh, a black car, and he said, I found one, I had got it restored. The next time Sammy came to town, I showed it to him, and it was right next to the white car. <laughs> one, one birthday, I, I never, it's fantastic. I got a yellow Rolls Royce convertible, the casino gave me. I was <laughs> dumbfounded. I had a go all I tell you. But it was pretty exciting. I've never had a present like that since. While Bill was known for his car collection, he also dabbled in other forms of rapid transportation. And Mr. Hara owned uh, a, uh, a supercharged speedboat that was entered in the uh, uh, into the races here, it was called Tahoe Miss. And I had gone to say hello to him in his booth, uh, him and uh, uh, Sherry, and, uh, and he remembered the time about the, uh, the, the car incident, and he said, by the way, have you ever, have you ever uh, taken time to look at our boat down there? And, uh, and the Tahoe Miss, I said, no, I haven't. I said, in fact, I was thinking I was going down there tomorrow and, and looking around uh, because they had the the big races down here. And he said, well, why don't you uh, go down there and, and uh, take a ride? And, uh, and I said, are you gonna be there, Mr. Harry? He said, yes, I'll be down there. And I said, uh, well, are you driving? And, and, and he said, why? I said, well, in all respect, Bill, if you're driving, I'm not going. And uh, he just, you know, he just uh, laughed and, uh, and I never did get down to see them anyway. Bill's collection became famous around the world, but what is not as well known is how Bill played a role in what would become a tradition at one of America's most famous races. He is the one who took me to Indy the first time. This past year was our 100th anniversary of the Indy, and this was my 39th year to open the race. It's kind of a funny story. We were at the Indy 500 and Bill and I are sitting there and uh, some other friends of his. And uh, Tony Holman, who owns the track and started the Indy 500, he, uh, he came over to say hello to Mr. Hara and uh, they were old friends. And when he came to our seat, he had seen my show at Lake Tahoe and he recognized me and he suddenly said, hey, Jim, he said, you wanna sing the song? And I said, I, I thought he meant the Star Spangled Banner. And I said, well, yeah, okay. And so Bill said, yeah, go. So I got up and I went under the track and went over there and Mr. Hellman introduced me to the conductor of the Purdue band. And I'm talking to this guy, I says, hey, what, what key do you guys do this in? And he, he said, well, we only got one key. I said, no, no, I said, Star Spangled Banner's got two keys. He said, you're not singing Star Spangled Banner. This is five minutes before race time in front of 500,000 people. I said, what the hell am I singing? He said, you're opening the race with Back Home Again in Indiana. I said, well, I'm from Alabama. And he started laughing. He said, do you know it? I said, well, yeah, I know the tune, but I, I'm not sure about the lyrics. And he said, and so now it's down to about two or three minutes before the race. I write the lyrics on my hand, you know, and then suddenly they point at me and says, here we go. And so, as I say, 39 years later, I'm still going at it. But whether Bugatti or Buick, he loved them all. I, I, I have always said that I think if, if he could have taken the cars with him, he would have. I he did not want to leave that, those cars to anybody. 
There are literally hundreds of stories about these automobiles and how they were acquired, but I'd like to tell you today about just two of those stories. This early 1928 Model A Ford that we now know was owned by the famous silent movie star Mary Pickford was given to her by her equally famous husband, Douglas Fairbanks, on Christmas Eve 1927. Ford, in their advertisement, said it was the first ever delivered, the first Model A ever delivered. It was sort of true, but an exaggeration. Several other cars have been purchased or sold, but this was the only one delivered by Etzel Ford himself. The auto collection received a letter in 1965 asking if they wanted to buy it for $2,000 by T.F. Hartness of Missouri. He told them about the early title from Christmas Eve uh, showing Pickford as the owner. That didn't interest Mr. Hare much at the time, rather that the serial number 1154 showed that it was one of the earliest Model A's still in existence, even though it was in pretty rough shape. Hartness wanted $2,000 for the car but the Hera team offered him 500. In a memo from our library, it shows that eventually Hartness cut his asking price in half to, to $1,000. So the team asked Mr. Hare what to do. In a handwritten, handwritten note, you can see here, he wrote, remain at $500. Well, two years later, after some more reflection about the value of the movie star heritage of the car, they finally bought it at $1,000. It was still, still a tremendous bargain. That was a Hera trait. He seldom overpaid for a car. But don't mistake Mr. Hera's uh, quality of wanting good value when he bought a car for the fact that he wasn't willing to spend big money. In fact, some of his best bargains actually came at a very high price. Like this beautiful 1936 Type 500K Mercedes Special Roadster. It was part of a collection of 71 vehicles that Mr. Hara bought as a group for $975,000 in 1975. Few collectors had the resources then to make such a large purchase all at once, let alone where could they house 71 cars. Was it a foolish investment? As part of this same purchase, he also got a very rare 1914 Detroit Electric with the expensive Edison nickel iron battery upgrade. This car was originally owned by John D. Rockefeller Jr. Somewhat interesting that the son of the man behind Standard Oil Company was driving an electric car. So what happened to the collection once Mr. Hara died? Perhaps surprisingly, Mr. Hara was a multimillionaire, but only on paper. Individually, he had quite a few debts from his flamboyant and lavish lifestyle and perhaps several alimony payments. He owned 78% of all the Hera stock, which was worth millions, but he had no cash. The auto collection and 12 personal cars that were in his garages belonged to the corporation then, not Hera. That left his wife, Verna, and their two adopted sons, Tony and John, with no way to settle the debts or pay the taxes. Longtime Hera attorney, Mead Dixon, worked with the estate to negotiate a sell of the stock it was the best solution for the family and the existing stockholders. Not so good for the car collection. Holiday Hotels purchased the stock for $300 million and held a series of auctions to sell the vehicles, which eventually netted about $100 million. Fortunately, Dixon and Harris' new president, Phil Satry, convinced Holiday Inns to donate 175 of these vehicles to the Reno community. If they could raise the funds to build a proper museum. Well, it took 10 years, but we opened here on Lake Street in November of 1989, and we got quite a few gems, including this valuable Mercedes. One other question remains, what happened to cause the Reno Casino, the flagship, if you will, to close this summer? And it wasn't COVID-19. It's an interesting story. When Mr. Hara died in 1978, he left behind a very talented team. Here's a few of them in this 50th anniversary shot. From left to right, Joe Francis, the GM at Lake Tahoe. And of course, always a few entertainers. Then Rip Taylor. Then the president of Harris, Phil Satry. Entertainer Danny Thomas. Michael Rose, who was the CEO of Holiday Inns. Debbie Reynolds. Richard Gigline, the COO of Holiday Inns. And entertainer Tony Orlando. Along with Mead Dixon and Lloyd Dyer, Harris eventually expanded to 26 casinos in 13 states. They partnered with Indian tribes and built gorgeous casinos in Arizona, California, North Carolina, 
They also opened river boats in Illinois, Missouri, and Indiana. In Las Vegas, they bought the Rio and converted the Holiday Inn on the Strip to Harris. Things were so good that the company went private in 2007 in what is called the leverage buyout. Investors purchased the company for $30 billion, but they had to borrow nearly $24 billion to do it. But surely when they borrowed that money, they didn't count on the recession of 2008. It forced them to declare bankruptcy. While they emerged from that bankruptcy and went public once more as Caesars, things didn't get any better here in Reno. With all the new competition from Indian casinos in Northern California, they simply stopped investing in improvements and basic maintenance for Reno. The property fell into serious disrepair and was starting to look dingy. Ironically, local El Dorado Resorts here in Reno purchased the entire public company in a transaction that was finalized just this summer. Since the El Dorado already has three very well-maintained properties downtown, it was a no-brainer for them to close Harris. The casino and the two hotel towers were sold to Las Vegas-based CAI properties, and it'll be used as a non-gaming operation with shops and housing units. I'd like to end this talk with another clip from the Legend of William F. Hera DVD that Caesars produced. This one about how the employees felt about Mr. Hera. Oh, Mr. Hera, I miss you. I wish he was still here. I think it'd be more of a, of a, a personal level thanks, Bill, for your help uh, along the years. You know, it's uh, we had a very uh, sort of a distant relationship, but it was a relationship that you that you don't forget. I felt very fortunate just to know him and, and to work for him. You know. It was a great privilege. It was, an, it was an honor to be an employee of Harris, and uh, I still feel that way. I would thank him for allowing me to uh, express myself to him. I would thank him for employing people of color. I'd say you did a great job. Harris is a, still a great uh, uh, place to work and play in this community. I can't, I can't phrase it. Maybe there is better things to explain, but uh, in my humble way, I would say thank you, you know. I would just tell him how much I enjoyed all those years. Uh, it was a job that I loved. I really did. Again, we'd like to thank Caesars for those clips that we used during this presentation. They're from the uh, Centennial Celebration. The DVD is called The Legend of William F. Hera. And we also got video from Video Velocity for the shots of the third auto auction. By the way, you can buy the full-link DVDs in our museum store. That's it for this month. I hope you also get a chance to come here to the museum where we've got an exhibit reflecting on the life and times of Bill Hare. And it'll give you a chance to see this very, very rare, only four of them left, of this 1934 Packard. It's a Model 1108 Phaeton Sport with dual cow. It's an absolutely gorgeous car. It's one of those that were sold at the auction of the Harris cars by the Holiday Inns Corporation, but we've got it back thanks to a loan from the Robert M. and Ann Lee collection. So a rare chance to see the car, learn a bit more about Mr. Hare. We hope to see you here.